Hey, what is going on, church? Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever watched a movie that I I personally love. And I, I know that if my wife is watching this right now, she's probably rolling her eyes because she really does not like this movie. And it's because it's so cheesy and it's it's just, I think it's hilarious. And it honestly has a lot of profound moments. Uh, hopefully you guys get the chance to watch a uh, movie by the name of Rango. And if you're wondering why am I bringing that up, Rango is a story about a lizard, okay? Lizard who lives literally in his little um, tiny cube that has sand and some water. And the whole time you're watching the beginning of the movie, he's pretending to be an actor and he's trying to fulfill this role um, where he is the hero and, and he has these literal plastic toys in his in enclosure that he's, he's interacting with and he's pretending to be an actor with. And one of them is a dead cockroach. That being said, he gets tossed from his, his little, you know, box, his reality, into the desert. And he's a nobody from nowhere. And he shows up to this tiny little town that is going through this catastrophe of having no water in the desert. And I'm not going to ruin the, the movie for you, but here's, here's the whole point. is that it, it, the whole, There's one um, um, phrase that the spirit of the West says to him. And the spirit of the West is none other than Clint Eastwood. I mean, who else would be in a Western, right? And I love the phrase that he tells him. He tells him, listen, no man can walk out of his own story. I always love that phrase. I'm like, man, that is profound. It may not be as profound to you. What I love is that it brings to light a very much uh, truth, a common truth for all of humanity. Uh, we think that we are, in fact, the centers of our own story. We think that we are the heroes of our own story. Um, when in reality, yours and I's story, we're not the centerpieces. We're not the main characters. We're not the heroes. We are not the villains. We're not, we're part of a greater narrative. And the human tendency is that we cannot live outside of ourselves. Thus, no man can walk out of his own story. But what if we could? What if we could live a life in which we actually find our proper place in the story of history? And that is that we are not the center. The universe does not revolve around us. And I know that there's a lot of people that are probably watching right now going, uh, you don't know me, okay? I am the center of the universe. Sure, <laughs> you keep thinking that. Let me know how that turns out. I bring this up because we've been going through a series where we're trying to ask ourselves, as, as a church, what are we? Like, What's our point? So we go through the book of Acts. And as we've gone through the book of Acts, we have found out that, one, uh, there's a collection of believers that Jesus is creating a new genesis, if you will, a new beginning, a new humanity because of his, his life, death, and resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, things are becoming new. In fact, we are looking into this thing called the Messianic Age, which is what we live in today, the church age, right? It is the fact that Jesus, from his life, death, and resurrection, from there on in, he is redeeming and renewing the earth and the universe and everything else, okay? So this isn't just a you and me thing. What I love is in our story, we find out John... Peter, they're going to a time of prayer. There's a man who can't use his legs, and boom, he's healed. Why? Because Peter tells him, in the name of Jesus, meaning the character and person of Jesus, stand up and walk. The man's legs that were atrophied for over 30 years, he hasn't been able to walk since he was born. All of a sudden, he is able to jump, leap, run. I mean, he is holding on to Peter and John, and he's just beyond excited. Now he's walking into the temple where he used to only be allowed outside. Our story begins in Acts chapter 3, verse 11. And I want to read it to you, and then I want to kind of take a moment to understand why Peter takes this opportunity to preach a sermon, and also what is his intention with the sermon. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn towards the end, which is the book of Acts. You want to turn to chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, While he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people were utterly astonished ran towards them in what is called Solomon's Colony. By the way, that's where a lot of believers started to collect. That was one of the places Jesus taught. 
So it's kind of a Solomon's colony was a, collect in, a collection a area for all those who were following Jesus, right? When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as though we had made him walk by our own power of godliness? I love what Peter, Peter already did just at the get-go. He gets the point. This situation is not about them. This situation isn't by them. Peter and John are not the center. Everyone's looking at them going, how did you do this? What power do you possess? How did you? And he's taking the opportunity by the influence of the Holy Spirit to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Guys, we are not the main characters. We are not the heroes. And he sidesteps, moving over even more to let everyone know, no, the center here is Jesus. And he takes the opportunity to show and to prove why everything that has happened is meant to reflect back upon one person. The entire Old Testament pointed to the Messiah. The entire New Testament, including us, point back to the Messiah. Jesus is the center of the story. Not you and not I. So he continues on. He says, when Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we have made him walk by our own power? It's not by their ability. They don't have any magic powers. And I love the second thing Peter highlights, or our godliness. Pastor Johnny, are you telling me that the man being restored to walk has nothing to do with Peter and John's behavior? No. It has nothing to do with their moral compass. It has nothing to do with they earned it. They're holy enough. No. It also hasn't have anything to do with the guy's uh, brokenness and crippledness in his legs. Are you telling me that this is just God choosing to do what he wanted to do because he wanted to do it? Yes. To prove the person and character of Jesus is who he says he is. Continues on. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he decided to release him. You denied the Holy Righteous One and asked to have a murderer release you. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of you all. Peter just drew from the Old Testament scriptures, and he starts off by alluding to who God is. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is God's, you know, one of God's oldest ways of identifying himself. But why Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because Peter is eventually going to allude to the covenant promise that God gave to Abraham. What was that covenant? I am going to have a relationship with you, Abraham. By the way, who is Abraham? Exactly. Nobody. He didn't earn it. God just chose him. That's called grace. God chooses Abraham and says, I'm going to have a relationship with you and with your little family. Your family's going to explode. I'm going to have a relationship with them. And then they will open the door for me to have a relationship with everyone on this planet. But I'm going to accomplish that through my Messiah. This is a covenant promise. You guys want to hold on to that? Put it in your back pocket, okay? This is why he says it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, and it's important to recognize Jesus as a servant. Yes, he is the Messiah, but he is the servant's Messiah. This is what they did not expect. According to Isaiah 52 and 53, there was a suffering servant that Judaism decided, I guess this is a prophet that nobody cares about, or maybe someone else. It doesn't matter. It's not important. Actually, it's very important. Because they misinterpreted the Old Testament, they assumed that the Messiah wouldn't be suffering. Lo and behold, Jesus comes and suffers for you and I, showing his character and showing the character of God. He doesn't show up with a sword and shield, he shows up riding a donkey and willing to die on a cross. That's why Peter calls him, you deny the righteous one, the righteous one referring to the fact that he is the Messiah. You deny the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murder release to you. That was Barabbas, if you guys remember in the, in the narrative of, of the Gospels. And it matters that it was Barabbas. Why? One, he's a murderer. Why in the world did you pick him over Jesus who's never murdered anybody? But not only that, it's his name. Bar Abbas, sons of the Father. 
the sons of the fathers are released. And it is the Son of Man who takes their place. A huge significance in this. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong. So Peter brings it about. He's bringing this to one main point. The way that this man is walking is not by me, and it's not by John, and it's not by our power, and it's not by our godliness. This is literally God showing you that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Messiah. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance. He's referring to the fact that they did not know what they were doing, just as your leaders also did. In this very way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Now he's getting alluding again back to Isaiah 52 and 53. And he's saying, listen, I know you denied him. I know you put him to death. But here's the deal. Even in your ignorance, God is still giving you the grace of forgiving you and giving you the opportunity to repent, which is why verse 19 exists. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. Peter is offering them the, what is grace? Grace is God giving us the ability to do the things that we cannot do on our own, according to Dallas Willard. That grace goes in so many different areas. One of them is giving us the ability to repent, giving us the ability to change the direction of our lives, to reorient ourselves where Jesus is the center. He is the purpose. He is the, the means. He is, he is your everything. That is what it means by repentance, not just, hey, stop sinning. Yeah, good luck with that. It's not a, it, you know, it's, we, we are broken. Apart from Jesus, we can't be unbroken. That's why when we repent, what we're saying is, I'm changing the way that I think, I'm changing the way I live, I'm changing the way that I spend my time, my money, my energy, my, you name it, whatever, whoever I was, is now being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. That is what he means. Repent. And what is the result of the repentance? I love this. That seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, whom, you, whom was appointed for you as Messiah. Jesus was meant to be your Redeemer. Jesus was meant to come live his life as an example for us on how life should be. He came to die for our sins, and he rose from the dead to show that God had accepted his sacrifice for you and I. As a result, now we receive the Holy Spirit if we're willing to receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is renewing us from the inside out and renewing the entire universe as we know it. His, his redemption, his messianic age, his renewing all things such as ankles and legs that we've seen in the previous story, this is proof that Jesus says who he says he is. Again, folks, the point of history is for we, the church, to point to him and bring everyone to the saving knowledge that Jesus is who he says he is. Where have we failed? We have failed as believers because we believe that the world is about us. We believe that we are the center of all things. We believe that we are the heroes of our story. We believe that we are the center of attention. And social media doesn't help. It makes us, again, I, I need enough likes. I need people to recognize me. I need people to acknowledge that I matter and that I'm significant, that I'm the... On and on this thing goes. Sorry, I have to check the microphone. No, we're not the center. We don't need the attention. We don't need to be significant. No, the, one, the way that our significance matters is when we find our identity in Him. When we find our personality being transformed into the likeness of Jesus, now we're starting to be part of the massive story. Now we're actually being part of a narrative that we were intended to be a part of, and that is the history that God has created. But when we separate ourselves from that, when we deny Jesus, we deny his narrative because we want our own, then we're on our own. And we don't get any of God's promises. We don't get the relationship. We don't get anything. All because of the stubbornness of our own heart of, I want to be my own storyteller. Watch Rango. Let me know how it goes. Peter continues. Verse 21, heaven must receive him until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. Why were his legs 
renewed because Jesus is restoring all things to the way they were supposed to be. Moses said, according to verse 22, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to everything he tells you. And everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. Do you remember Abraham's covenant with God? God is going to have a relationship with Abraham. As a result, God is going to have a relationship with the rest of the world. If and only if they accept Jesus as the Messiah, is their story a part of God's story? Moses said, there's going to be someone like me, but greater than me, and you need to listen to him. If you deny him, you're not part of the story. And what I love is Judaism took this passage and thought, maybe it's just a prophet in the future, because we've never seen anyone like Moses, let alone greater. That's why Peter brings it up, because he's saying, this Jesus is the one that is greater than Moses. He is the Messiah. Do you not see it? The, the, it was promised that the Messiah would restore all things. Look, things are being restored. In addition to all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel, those and after him have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. The very promise we just talked about. Why Samuel? Samuel was the one that anointed David as king. Samuel, maybe not knowing, prophetically spoke about David and said, David, from your line will come a kingdom that will have no end. Well, David's line wasn't the point. And David's kingdom actually had an end. So what kingdom is this that Samuel's talking about? From Samuel onward, everyone is pointing at the same thing. There is going to come a king who is a priest and a prophet. That is the Messiah, the one and only God in the flesh. And why is he here? Because God is fulfilling his promise that he gave to Abraham. I am going to renew and restore the entire earth because it is broken. And I'm going to do it through you, with you, and for the rest of the nations. Verse 26, God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Redemption starts with Israel, but it is through Israel that redemption is available to us all. You see, Peter was already prophetically speaking. Is not the promise just for Abraham? No, it's for Abraham and through Israel to the rest of the nations. The rest of the nations will be blessed. And the word blessed doesn't have to do with finances or possessions or any of that. No, he's saying a relationship with God is going to happen the way that we as human beings were meant to be in a relationship with God. But by whom? Reorient your life. Step away from the center. Jesus is the one. That matters here. This whole universe is being redone through Jesus, for Jesus, by Jesus. The Spirit just healed someone. Why? So that we could show up? No. We are not the center. We are not the goal. We are not the heroes. He is. Everything like this happens to show that Jesus is who he said he was and continues to be. And he's not a passive Lord that is off in some bubble, some universe, waiting to his second re return. No, he is actively doing things with his people. He is actively renewing and restoring life even now. See, that's the weird thing, is that we are anticipating the redemption of all things, the renewal of all things. But at the same time, it's currently happening. It's happening through our prayers, through our partnering with God, through our spending time with him and abiding with him through him giving us commands and saying, co-labor with me, co-rule with me. Like, let's do this together. He is desiring to have his people, which, by the way, is everyone, including you who are listening. 
Here's my prayer for you. I hope that you can get out of your own story. I hope that you can learn to draw the attention back to the one who matters. I hope that you and I can learn that the reason why we live is to bring Jesus to the forefront and center so that other people can have a relationship with him just as you and I do. That's why we live. We don't live for ourselves. We live for others as Jesus taught us. We don't live just to get ours. No, we live to make sure that others have and that others know and that others have the opportunity to reorient their lives so that Jesus is Lord and Messiah of their kingdom. To put it a better way, that their kingdom would finally submit itself to the true kingdom of Christ, of God, and of the Holy Spirit. I hope that we can learn that we are not the centers of our story. I hope that we can learn that through submission and faith and trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus, his life and his resurrection, and through that one thing that we don't want to talk about in church today, repentance. That we're willing to turn our lives around and say, I'm going to reorient my life so that Jesus is Lord. He is the one in control. He is the one that is showing me how to become more like him. Grace and peace be with you. This is the way. Have a great Sunday.